We're delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Ditol Banega Swast India. It is our pleasure today to present Animal, Lisa Tadeo in conversation with Supriya David. Lisa Tadeo's debut novel, Animal, is a provocative exploration of female rage fueled by male violence and savagery. A tale of trauma and revenge, it viscerally takes us through the protagonist's attempts to understand her present while coping with the abuse of her past. In conversation with Supriya David, Tado discusses the raw embers of female rage in a male-dominated society and the precarious intertwining of violence and memory. Lisa Tado. Lisa Tado is an author, journalist, and a two-time recipient of the Pushcart Prize for her short stories, 42. 2017. Her 2019 nonfiction book, Three Women, became a number one New York Times and the international bestseller and is currently being adapted by Showtime as a TV series. Tado's debut novel, Animal, was published in June 2021. Supriya David. Supriya David is the editor in chief of Argeo Lux, a luxury e commerce portal by the Reliance Group. She's a former editor in chief of L India. Her novel, A Cool Dark Place, was published by Penguin Random House. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comment section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at Jaipur Lit Fest. Ladies and gentlemen, Animal, Lisa Tado in conversation with Supriya David. Over to you, Supriya. Thank you to everyone at the Jaipur Literature Festival to make this happen. Lisa, I've been such a huge fan of all your books. I mean, Three Women and uh, an Animal. And I think having this conversation with you is a lot like, you know, uh, Catcher in the Rye, where <laughs> Holden says, you know, you just wish you could call the author up and say, what a good book you've written. This is my time. So I felt the book, it was so cool. It just moved, it shifted so much in me. And I'm so grateful that we're having this conversation. So I want to actually start with, you know, I found the book so wonderfully unapologetic in its ability to talk about rage, power, control, and abuse. And to start with, you know, what prompted you to write this book? And forgive me for saying this, but I just feel that it's also a story of so many women, uh, like a collective history of secrets of women who have probably told a story at a bar in confidence when you meet them while you're waiting for your kid. You know, so many stories, but, you know, you've woven it into one narrative. Am I right to assume that? Yes. I mean, it really, um, it it is really the culmination um, of so many years of talking to so many women, not just for the book, but also just my friends, um, my mother, you know, other ancestors, and uh, hearing so many things about, um, you know, I, I think that uh, hearing uh, with me too, and all of that, we've, we've gotten more comfortable with talking about things that we don't want um, on the surface. But I think that some of the stuff I wanted to explore was sort of the deep-seated feelings that, um, that come from, from living in a male-dominated society for so long. Um, all of the little things that, uh, for me, what was interesting to explore in animals specifically was um, that it's the things that we ourselves are complicit in that I think really affects us the most years later when we think, you know, for me, when I think of the things that I have let done to me um, knowingly, knowing that I wasn't going to like it, not just physical stuff, but, you know, and anything just verbal, um, you know, there's, there's some, the idea of, of letting something go and being cool about something and, all of that um it's it's such a it's such a it's it's so risky it, it's weird that it's risky to stand up for yourself in a moment and the risk sometimes even you know sometimes the risks are terrible like the risks are uh, assault and death and sometimes the risks are not as terrible but they are they are long lasting um and the risk can be like you know someone thinking you're not uh, a cool person 
or a amenable person or someone who w- wants to get the job done because, you know, they're bringing up other things. So, and, and I think all those things are like these roadblocks to being our honest selves. Um, and that's really what I wanted to explore the most. For those who haven't read the book, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, this anti-heroine, Joan? Uh, She manages to terrify, she's combustible, yet there is a part of me and a huge part of me that that finds us so vulnerable that I want to sympathize with her. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, so for those of, uh, for people who have not read it, it it starts out with... um, a woman who uh, is at dinner with a a man that she is in love with, uh, or was at one time in love with, and who is married, when another man who is also married comes in and shoots himself in front of her, um, and sort of sets off this, she's been living the status quo life of of, of dealing with things, of, of reacting when things happen to her. And this is the first time in a long time that she is sort of uh, activated to go and figure out why she's been living like this. And in, in a lot of ways, it's sort of like a, a metaphor for, you know, for when something just kind of kicks us in the seat yeah. of our pants and makes us change. Um, and sometimes we need something like that, you know, and, and I think that's okay. I think there's a lot of stress put on people, women specifically, like, you know, do yoga, go <laughs> yeah. to class, do this. If you do all these things and you're still depressed and it's still something else that you do, like there's all these things that you have to do. And sometimes it's exhausting just to go and do those things. You think about the fact of all the things you're not doing right to take care of yourself. So, um, so that's what that was for me. I wanted Joan to have this, like, this catalyst in a sense to get her to get her moving. Um, and, you know, she goes and tries to figure out why she has been this way, and the reason she has has allowed things to be done to her is because of something that happened in her childhood that kind of stunted her growth, which is, I think, something that happens to so many of us. And and the thing that happens in our childhood, it doesn't have to be one big thing. For some of us, it is one big thing. And for other of us, it is an accumulation of a a billion little things. Um, You know, and Joan talks a lot about the sort of various rapes that happen. And, um, and the idea is that, you know, the word rape, we, we have it, it is, it means something, right? It means something physical and real. But then there's also, there are other smaller rapes and that add up. And I think that the adding up of those things, it's not like it's saying like the addition of all these, the accumulation of these rapes is equal to one large rape. It's not about that. For me, it's about um, each woman is different in what she feels is something that is taken from her. So, you know, somebody could be taken by something, like somebody could feel, uh, you know, wronged by something that their mother did to them in a certain way. And that can feel like a violation to someone else. It might not be a violation. So that's something I really wanted to talk about is the idea that we each get to own what is a violation. You know, we should, and, and other, the rest of us should listen and we shouldn't put um, degrees of, of negativity on one thing and, and, you know, oh, well, that's okay. That's not that big of a deal. Like, who are we to assume what is someone else's big deal? Yeah. Very well put. Yeah. I think memory, like you said, I mean, plays a visceral role in the book. I mean, it changes the narrative of the book. She explains a moment, then she goes back into her past and somehow soon enough comes back into a present state and you navigate over, you know, two decades of childhood scars, grief, you know, parents' death, bad relationship choices Uh, and as a writer how tough was it for you to structure different periods of time all within the same time because the book is really gritty and straightforward in its discussion of violence and sex and rage trauma all of that but how did you arrive at your style um you know for me I've always loved uh, uh what I love is the way that memory and present um are in conversation yeah. So I like, I like there to be a sort of messiness. Like I don't necessarily like the idea of there being a chapter on um, childhood and then going back yeah. to 
chapter on uh, because that's not the way that it feels to me. You know, we don't sort of separate our, our memories, our past is living with us constantly. Yes. And that's kind of the, um, the way that I wanted the book to feel. And is there a reason why you set it in, why you moved Joan away from New York to Tupanga Canyon in California? Um, well, for me, one of the things that was important to me was that Joan, um, I, I was, you know, the, the, I've lived in, I lived in many places for three women. And, and one of the places I did live in was in Topanga. Um, and it was, uh, it was an oppressive heat. And I think that there's something about having um, in, in my life and the, the things I've suffered, the sort of the grief I've, I've suffered, the loss, et cetera. I've found that being uncomfortable, being physically uncomfortable on top of being emotionally destitute is awful. Um, and I've always kind of, you know, I've been fortunate to be able to, uh, uh, with my father, I wasn't, but with my mother's death, I was able to, to be more, um, to be more physically comfortable after that. So I always think of, you know, um, but I have suffered in the opposite way too, and being like physically uncomfortable too. And, and my mother who grew up very poor, when her brother died when she was a child, they had no food to eat, nothing. Um, so the idea of suffering doubly, like suffering physically, not being able to eat, starving, being cold, being hot, um, on top of being on top of being in, in deep pain is is something I think a lot of people don't have not experienced. So and, and I wanted for me, I guess I wanted to put Joan in this most terrible of places um, in terms of the physical oppression of the heat and all that, because there are so many of us who suffer in so many um, uh, wild and uncontrollable ways. And other people who have not suffered as much don't really see it unless it's shown to them in exactly the, the pitch that it is. So I wanted Joan's suffering to feel visceral. I wanted to feel the heat of it. So that's why I moved her to LA um, and it's some, Topanga specifically, someplace where I live that is absolutely stunningly beautiful, but so hot, so dry it can be so suffocating. If you're not living in a place like that under like really nice conditions, it's really hell. I want to go a little off topic. And you know, when you say Topanga is so hot, but mm -hmm. Jane, I think in some ways seems like a foodie to me. And she's always cooking these really amazing food. And I just kept thinking, how is she managing this in this heat? Because she's <laughs> always doing things together, you know? But is that yeah, something yeah. that comes from my own I mean, personal interest towards food, or is that something that you grew up with, or is that something that you just gave Joan? I, um, it's both. I, um, I, I love food. I grew up, my mother was very into food. I think that in an Italian family, you know, not just Italian, but for me, that was how I grew up. The, the specific, the sort of like caretaking via food is something that is a big part of, um, of, of, of life. But what I wanted Joan to have on top of that was a sort of understanding and desire for luxury that, yeah. uh, that was, that was given to her by the sort of circumstances that she was around. So the idea that yet and yet again, to know what the best restaurant is, or to know what the best clothing brand is, and then to not be able to afford it is its own unique, you know, pain. I yeah. think that's, well, you know, it just depends. Usually people who are in certain economic classes are, are comfortable because they have lived through, but there are some people who have gone up and down, which is something my mother did too, in a lesser way than Joan. But, you know, my mother, um, when she was young, was like courted by, uh, you know, these, these head, these like wealthy men but she was going back to a house that had almost that had no running water and no food. And the idea of the jumps of that, also the idea, which is something that Joan says, that you know, some years in her life she made enough money to do whatever she wanted, and then the next year she would have nothing. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a unique um, uh, degradation to that. Um, it really highlights the the wealth and poverty of, of this country, I mean, all countries, but, you know, America, places I've lived, 
you know, is New York City anything? You can be, you can be somebody who makes $10 million a year living next to somebody who makes, you know, 20,000 a year. And it's just, it is barely surviving. And, and that is so, um, it's so hard for me to square that and, yeah. and to continue squaring that. I mean, it's just really, it's, it's weird to, to just know that people are working triply hard and making nothing. It, yeah. It's, it's something that is so confusing to me. <laughs> so, um, so I wanted Joan to sort of, uh, to, to show that. Uh, I want to ask you, what, what was your relationship with your mother? I um, mean, and how, how personal is the book? Uh, you know, did a lot of your own experiences, uh, childhood, nostalgia, all of that, did, did that all influence the narrative in some way? Yes. Um, it, it's fair. There's a lot of personal stuff in, in animal. Um, the, the, the mother in animal is not, is is harsher than my own mother was but um what what is there is the sort of the always wanting more from her wanting more affection attention not that my own mother did was you know particularly withholding in the way that um joan's mother is in animal is a sort of uh is a um is a, is a very big exaggeration of my own mother, but those are the those are similar feelings mm -hmm. and, and thoughts and kind of like one of the things that um that I find so trenchant is uh, well when Joan's trying to like sneak into her mother's bed, um that was a combination of of me feeling that way and also my brother telling me that he used to sneak into her bed when he was a kid and he didn't want to wake my dad up so for him it was being quiet not to wake my father um and then you know lena the one one of the women in three women was very careful to like put her hand on her husband's back in, in a in a way that he would not like she wanted to have the physical contact but she didn't want him to startle him by putting her hand there so she would like lower her hand like by degrees and I think that that need for touch and the con the concurrent fear of touching someone and, and making them upset or angry is so sad um, to me. And it's something that I felt in in minimal ways that I exaggerated to kind of show how 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 hard the feeling can be. Mm. I think um, what you do so beautifully and poignantly is animal shifts the focus from feminine desire to rage. And why did you want to write about that emotion? And is there something that, you know, that years of, you know, you keep, we keep a lot of histories within us, right? Is that, is that something that you've been, that you've experienced a lot in your life, people around you? Is, is there something in particular that, because there is a lot of rage and if for me, because I love the book and I'm very biased, I think it's very justified. But what, what, I mean, what prompted you to examine this emotion? Well, um, I've, I've had a lot of grief in my life. And I think that um, that grief, the rage often comes from a, a severe places of pain. Um, and my own grief, I think, and my own rage certainly did. Um, I think the biggest rage in Animal is not so much rage against, um, against men who uh, want something physical from you. I think that the rage in, in animal that I, I wasn't exactly checking it and monitoring it, but where it, where a lot of Joan's um, rage came from was the rage of, of grief, the grief of um, the questions of why is this person alive and not my father? And that's something that I felt a lot in, in the days following my father's death. My father and mother did not die the way that Joan's parents did, yeah. but um they did die and it did affect me and um it affected me greatly and i remember after my dad's accident i would see people on the street who were just acting not exactly kind or you know i would just just see anyone who just seemed like they were like selfish or spoiled or cruel and i would just be so angry you know like why is this person still alive why is my father like and and that sort of feeling of confusion and 
and the randomness of death and grief and, and the randomness of when things happen is something that really, um, really, and I think that rage is a way of dealing with grief. If you sort of kick the rage out, Ward, instead of letting it implode, all in on you. I think that that makes it easier sometimes if you're in a really bad place. Mm. Why is anger? I mean, according, I mean, given what you've written, even with three women, animal, why is anger? I mean, con con I mean, just your thoughts. Why is it considered a dangerous emotion for women? Um, why is anger considered a dangerous yeah. emotion? For women in particular. Oh, yes. I mean, because I think that if we... <sighs> We have not been angry for so many years. We have been doing what um, what what we're su supposed to do, and I think that that's that's the thing that is the hardest for me. And I think you can see it in like personal one on one relationships. Sometimes yeah. when um, sometimes when you've been sort of giving somebody what they want, right? Like the whole like for example, I have. Uh, a working relationship with someone um and uh it, for many months i was doing exactly what i knew that person wanted and and then i realized that what that person wanted was not good for the work that we were doing i was mainly serving that person's ego when i started not doing it anymore even though it wasn't something i had to do by any means as i'm not working for this person at all um so there was no reason for me to be doing it when i stopped doing it there was a they became sort of confused and incensed like why is this why is this not easy for me anymore yeah. rather than sort of sorting through what they had done to try to sort of like force compliance um, there's this rage, uh, and then the rage is like, wait, wait, hold on a second, you've been doing everything I've wanted, now you're not doing it anymore, who do you think you are? And that's what I think it is, that's what I think everyone is saying to women, in a sense, it's like, who do you think you are? Yeah. You've been, you know, and it's, it's true of race, it's true of everything. The second someone who has previously not um, advocated for themselves, the second they begin to, it makes the people who have been used to them not advocating for themselves, it makes other people angry and uncomfortable. And it's not exactly that person. It's not anyone's fault. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, why you wouldn't want it to change if it's been easy for you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So men, you know, for the most part, it's like, and then, then they put not all, you know, not all men and not most men, but, but people who, you know, for years have been like, used to a certain level of compliance they go into this spot where they're like wait, wh wait this woman's angry what has she got to be angry about she's and, and the reason that she's angry is because she hasn't been allowed to get angry this whole time and now the anger is unsettling and it's unbecoming and you know we're so used to men being angry we're so okay yeah. with it it's like it's like, you know, it's like tigers getting their way and, and the, you know, it's like, it, but women do it and it's like catty and, and despicable. And it's just because we haven't seen it. And it's yeah. just, we're not used to it. And the second we're not used to something, we're like, whoa, hold on a second. Get yeah. back in your spot. Um, there's something that I've always wondered, and I more so after I read Animal, was how do women understand when someone is truly angry and when they're just being gaslit? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that I think being gaslit is absolutely one of the cruelest things that you can do to a person. Um, you're asking, how do you know if you're being gaslit? Yeah. No. And how do women understand like the difference between when someone is truly angry and when they're just being gaslit? In that sense? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you can tell. I, I think that it's hard because some people are really good at, at gaslighting. Yeah. Um, and, and the people who are the best at it are the ones who don't even know that they're doing it. And so you can't call them yeah. out on it, you know, because that's part of the issue is they're gaslighting themselves too. It's easier to, you know, to go, oh, no, I didn't do that. I would never. I didn't mean that. It's just easy yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I think that you have to have really, uh, for me, when I feel like I'm being gaslit, the thing that's the easiest for me is to write it down. I find that um, whenever somebody, you know, like in a working relationship or something, when someone's like, let's, let's talk, let's sit down and talk. And it's like, okay, what I'd like to do is write down my feelings first so mm -hmm. that I can see them. Because I think sometimes when you're talking to somebody, there's a lot of stuff that happens in conversation where yeah. it's like, you know, someone just throws something else out. When something's in writing and you're asking someone, please respond to this specifically, this yeah. thing that I'm saying right here. Don't bring something else up. Don't don't bring in a tangential thought. Just respond to this. That is a way for me when I feel like I'm being gaslit. If I can I put down my exact thought and then I ask the person, can you respond to just that line? Yeah. That's how yeah. I feel. Do you not think you do that? You don't think you do that? Okay, I still think you're doing that. You know, um, I think that I, I think that writing stuff down and having people be uh, like see what they're doing in in a very clear way um, and not let them move away from it until it's addressed is, is yeah. a really good thing to do. That's and if the person doesn't want to do and if the person doesn't want to do that, it's a good indication that they might be gaslighting. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I mean, that's a healthy way of responding or expressing anger also, right? Just to put it down to figure out yeah. where you stand in, in yeah. light of yeah. Um, I think one of the questions uh, I wanted to ask you was, how can you stop yourself from feeling murderous when someone calls you emotional when you're just angry with reason? <laughs> How do you stop yourself from feeling murderous? I, I don't know, because that's where a lot of my anger comes from. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I, uh, there was a man, a handyman who came to um, fix uh, some, some plumbing issues we had. And I was, you know, I was, it's the, still the pandemic. We're in fact way back where we started in so many ways. I was, you know, in my pajamas and um, that I was also doing events on, on Zoom and I have a six-year-old kid and I was running around the house and I had, you know, I'm doing this TV show for three women. So I was like in the middle of 75 different things. And this man, I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm like, do you want a coffee? I'm so sorry. for Like, I forgot, you know, normally I'm like, ask people if they need something. I'm like, I'm so sorry. He's like, no, no, it's okay. I've dealt with a lot of frazzled housewives. And <laughs> I, I was like, okay, first of all, I'm, I'm apologizing for not having offered you coffee, which is ridiculous. Cause I shouldn't be doing that to begin with. Like, you know, it's the pandemic. I don't have to offer you coffee. I don't need to, I don't need you to think that I'm not, you know, a bitch in a sense is like what, you know, um, so I said, I'm not a frazzled housewife. I said, no, you know what? I am a, I am a housewife and I also, I also work and I have, but the way that he said it was so um, like, oh, silly housewife with your yeah. silly problem. And not, and that's not to say that if I, that a house, like for me, it's not like, oh, I'm more than a housewife because my mother was a housewife. I don't, you know, I don't think that being a housewife is any less than being a working woman and a housewife or, or whatever. It's the sort of the way that people are able to put you down in their little boxes. And when I told him all the things that I was doing, because I felt like he need, I felt like he thought that he was busy with his work and that I had nothing there. This person's in my house. I am paying them to do work for me. Um you know, if someone's paying me to be in their house and do work for them, I don't like, you know, put them down in what they're doing. Yeah. And so I, I felt enraged. Um, I, I felt enraged and I showed my rage. I think that sticking to when someone uses the word emotional, I think that um, I think that, you know, looking at them sort of in the eye and saying, it, emotional is something we are all emotional yeah. um the word emotional is not a negative word and my emotion right now is rage at you for calling me emotional yeah. so how do you want to you know proceed from here I don't like that you just said that do you like you know like I just yeah. very like in your face is is the best way I I I for me for me it's the best way to kind of be very pointed and and sort of like 
throw it back at them right in the moment. Yeah. Um, I think all around the world, I think you can see a cultural awakening of similar kind, right? I mean, women are becoming more intimate with layers of their anger as well. And mm -hmm. uh, we're becoming more articulate and expressive of it, just quite in the same way that you mentioned it. And we're more studied in the ways it knits together, the personal, the professional, the political. And we're not standing for any sort of nonsense, you know, and more conscious of the immense, like historic paradigm shifting power of recognizing that anger, especially when you're being called out, uh, quite in the same way that you said, what do you, I mean, do you agree with that in, in, in a way? The shifting, I'm sorry, the shifting paradigm of, I mean, you're, we're just more aware of our anger and we're, we, the, the, we call a spade a spade, uh, yeah. we have no bones about it. You know, we're, we're more confident about expressing our rage now than ever. Yes. yes. Yeah. Why do I think that is? Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, I think that little by little, um, you know, we go up and then we, we sort of regress and we've been, it's a cycle. But I think that every generation we get a little bit further. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not, it's okay that it's taking a long time because yeah. it's been so many years of it being um, unequal. Yeah. And, you know, it the pendulum needs to swing a lot in one direction for it to sort of normalize a little bit more. Um, but I think we're really getting there. And I think that the area that we still need help in is I think we're doing much better with men with, you know, women telling men what they don't want. I think that we need to do more um, with women. Women need to do more to uh, telling other women what they do want from each other. From I, th I think that that's where we're lacking now. That's the next mm -hmm. sort of lobe in the transformation that we need to, that we need to get right. Yeah. I want to come back to the book a little bit and I want to avoid the spoilers, but there is, you know, a character suffering a miscarriage and it was so shocking, so beautifully, gruesomely written. And, you know, it's, it's also disturbing in so many ways. And I read it, I reread it just to see that I missed something or did I, you know, did I imagine it, but it must have cut like a life. I mean, I know, I know it came from a private moment because I read up, but reliving it in the book, writing it, and it mustn't have been, it wasn't easy to read. So I'm sure it wasn't easy to write. Yeah. You know, I mean, for me, when I write things that are, it depends on what, you know, when I experienced the, the painful thing, um, for me, you know, I had, I had experienced a miscarriage and I'd also spoken to so many women who had experienced them, different levels of them, different levels of, of, of loss, different times, different, you know, things that they did afterwards. And I, um, for me, I really wanted, I wanted to sort of show how shocking and awful it can be. Um, so, I I used something that sort of metaphorically felt the way that it actually felt for me, uh, the loneliness of it um, and the sort of the the lonely pain of it because it's really a pain that you know um, that's hard. It's hard for other people to to feel it if they haven't yet you know felt a similar thing. It's hard for a man to understand it, you know, and so and and it was difficult to write, but for me. Um, I'm often, so much of my writing comes from things that I'm obsessed with, pains, mm -hmm. past pains that I'm obsessed with, things I try to work out, that writing it is like, you know, at least I can, um, at least I can make sense of it somehow. And sometimes I like the idea, not sometimes, all the time, I like the idea of making people feel less alone. And people who yeah. have had certain terrible things happen. I think sometimes reading about someone else experiencing something terrible is like, oh, okay. So I'm not, you know, I'm not alone in that sort of yawning grief. Yeah. Um, as a mom to a, you have a daughter, six-year-old daughter. Yes. Uh, are you very aware of the memories and gender stereotypes that your daughter will grow up around? I mean, I'm a mom of two kids. My son is seven, my daughter is five. I'm hyper aware of what they read, what they're doing, because- yes. I have this book, your book, traveling with me across the country when I was moving around when things had opened up. And they're like, Mama, you're reading this book for so long. You know, they, they were aware of what I was holding on to. And in the same way that I, you know, I figured out what they are reading um, and the world that they will eventually grow up in. Um, 
what is your view? I mean, with your daughter, when she asks you, Mama, what are you working on? Uh, how, how does it all fan up? What do you tell her? Um, I don't, you know, I mean, when it comes to what I'm working on, we're not really totally there yet with the content. For me, when it comes to what she's reading and watching, I am very sensitive to it. Um, the other day, actually not the other day, a couple of months ago, I was reading Peter Pan to her and I was like, oh my God, you know, Peter Pan has Tiger Lily and Wendy and Tinkerbell and all of these mermaids. And he gets to say like, when, you know, he tells Wendy to go take care of the lost boys. And, and like, and I was just, I was getting enraged that my daughter's head was being filled with this kind of, you know, and it's the same thing of like, princesses you know oh the prince chose this princess and there's a lot of stuff that's different now that, that they're making that's you know female centric and um but there's still so much of that patriarchy in in timeless fairy tales so i'm very cognizant of it part part of me i'm like okay look you know what i teach her in in the way that we act in the world and the way that my husband and i interact and the way that we interact with other people and the way that we treat everyone the same um you know uh those are the things that um that are going to matter and and if she reads these other things it won't be as uh as bad but I still I think about it constantly and I and every and like when she watches Barbie and stuff like that I'm like oh my god like what not that Barbie is even bad it's just that like you know what is good what is the right message and all these men but then there's all these then there's just kids at school I mean it's just so much and trying to control it and worrying about it is so I think about it all the time clearly because <laughs> when you said that I was like oh my god and my well, last question uh to you Lisa is what are you working on next I know you're adapting three women to tv uh do you want to tell us a little bit about that are you working on something else that you can talk about um yeah so I'm adapting it for TV. We have written all the episodes and we are in the middle of filming. Um, we're, we just filmed the first two episodes. It'll be on Showtime, I think, in November of next year. Um, and Ghost Lover, my collection of stories, is coming out in the summer. And I'm also working on the film version of Animal and a couple of other TV projects. That's amazing. This has been the highlight of my year. So the best way for me oh to end gosh, Thank you so but much. But thank you so, so much. Kind. No, Thank it's been you fun. So much. I needed to hear everything you said, especially what, <laughs> you know, what you were reading to your daughter. All of those things are so relevant and we never address it because mm -hmm. we get it at the fag end of the day when you're reading to them and you're so tired to think and then you wonder whether exactly. that's right, you know? Exactly. Can I think that? Am I overthinking it? Is it worth thinking exactly. or should we just get them to bed? You know? so, exactly. Right. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Jaipur Literary Festival. I hope to be there in person soon because it's the one I want to go to the most. Thank you, Lisa Tado and Supriya David for this riveting conversation. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Stay tuned for the next session.